Now, to me, the most compelling end to this sentence that I've come across was, some com- was from some commentary from a guy named Lauren Padelford. Now, if you haven't heard of him before, he's a VP at Shopify over in the US. And here's what he said, reflecting on the pandemic. He said, what COVID's done is it's acted like a time machine. It bought the 2030s forward to the 20- 2020s. And I reckon that is absolutely bang on. I mean, there are so many trends that if we'd had this conference in 2019, we would have said the next 10 years, this is likely what's going to happen. But stuff that people like me who've been studying these sort of trends for a whole lot of years now, stuff that was five or 10 years away has happened in the last two and a half years because of what we've just gone through. I mean, you think from a very practical perspective, how this has played out. I mean, think for instance, like of our use of QR codes. I mean, hey, QR codes, nothing new to see here. I was, I'm doing some work with Toyota a few months ago. One of their um, leaders was saying it was an engineer on the factory floor in Japan working for Toyota that invented the first QR code 34 years ago. So nothing new about QR codes, but they never really reached their potential until like a pandemic hit and we had to use these things like 673 times every day to like check in everywhere that we went. And this has fundamentally changed the way that organizations and brands are connecting with their customers. I mean, what are around the expo hall? How many QR codes do you see on the brochures and the posters for most of those stands? I mean, we wouldn't have done that in 2019. In fact, a case in point about how we've seen this one change, um, check this out, this time last year, a video streaming company in China created the world's first airborne QR code. Check out this puppy here. This is 1,500 drones flying information in the skies above Shanghai. And this thing actually worked like a normal QR code. You could hold your phone up to the sky and scan it, not like what loaded was a marketing message for something they launched the day before. And all my advertising mates, when they saw this, got all frothy and excited, like, this is the next frontier of advertising, to which I'm like, I sort of hope it's not. Like, I'd love to think the night sky doesn't become a billboard for the highest bidder, right? But it gives you a sense of just how rapidly this has changed. You wouldn't have done this in 2019 because people wouldn't have really known what to do with the QR code at that point. Now, you think about from a more fundamental perspective what has changed or accelerated over the last two and a half years, when the whole nature of work, remote work, hybrid work. I mean, it's interesting, of course, this was something that was coming. It was probably five to 10 years away, but of course, we did about a decade's worth of change in terms of figuring out remote and hybrid work in a couple of weeks in March and April of 2020. And of course, in this space, there wasn't a whole stack of remote and hybrid work because it's really difficult to run a feedlot working from home. And so, I mean, different industries, this played out differently. And yet, I mean, we've all got people in our worlds, in our families who had to, you know, pivot to figure out remote work really fast. And it was a steep learning curve, just like trying to figure out how to do this. In fact, I love this next little video that underscores just how rapidly this change affected us in terms of having to figure out the skills of remote work. Some of you may have seen this next little video. This is a video of a lawyer in Texas dialing into a court case using Zoom for the first time. And he didn't realize he had a a filter turned on to his Zoom feed. And again, if you have seen this video, you'll probably enjoy just like watching it again, like I do. If you haven't seen this next little video, um, you're welcome. I think you'll enjoy it. Let's have a quick look up here on the screen. Check it out. Mr. Ponton, I believe you have a filter turned on in the video settings. Uh, You might want to uh, Uh, take take a look. We're trying to, can you hear me, Judge? I can hear you. I think it's a filter. It, and the, it is, and I don't know how to remove it. I've got my assistant here. She's trying to, but uh, I'm prepared to go forward with it. That's, I'm here live. It's not, I'm not a cat. <laughs> I, can, I can see that. Don't you love it? I mean, who would have ever thought the phrase, I'm not a cat, like, would become a trending hashtag in 2021? But like, it, just, it does underscore just how much of like, a, a process of adapting this whole thing has been over the last two and a half years. So the question then is, what's coming next? Based on how much we've seen accelerate over the last two and a half years, what are the trends that we've got to really be dialing into if we're going to not get caught off guard by the future? If you look at the next three to five years, that's where the game is right now, trying to identify those sort of trends. And if we're going to do that, my encouragement to you is this. We all need to, right now, be focusing far more on tides than waves. 
Now, I just want to unpack this for a moment. I often use this as a metaphor to describe the type of trends, like the category of trends we really need to focus on, as opposed to the fads that like, come and go and can very easily distract us. And of course, you know, in this sector, you've, you've seen a couple of fads over the years, haven't you? The things that are going to be like the game changer. And then like a year later, you're like, where'd that ever get to? Nothing ever came of that. And I often liken those fads to being you know, like a wave at the beach. And you think a wave at the beach is loud and it's exciting, but it crashes ashore and then it retreats. And it doesn't leave a permanent mark. But in contrast, the tides are slower moving. They're completely silent. I and mean, it's actually easy to miss the changing of the tides, not even notice it's happening if you don't know where to look. But over time, a changing tide will reshape the entire coastline. And so for all of us right now, this is the biggest challenge. How do we identify those tidal changes, changes that can be often silent and easy to miss, but will be absolute game changers? And we could spend two or three hours just going deep, looking at that alone this afternoon, looking at what's happening in a whole lot of different areas. But I want to pull out two tides, two things that for all of us are going to be game changers over the next few years. And I wonder, from your standpoint, which of these two you think would be the biggest one for you. I have a hunch as to which one it'll be. Okay, but the first title trend that'll shape the next few years for all of us is gonna be around the acceleration of things like artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I mean, this sort of technology has been you know, coming ahead in leaps and bounds for a number of decades ago, but it really leapt forward throughout the COVID years. And we could look at so many examples of this, but just one that I've been tracking for a number of years now that really sped up during COVID is what we're seeing happen with artificial intelligence in our cars. I mean, what happens, for instance, when our, our vehicles get driven by an algorithm rather than us as humans? Now, I wonder how many of you find the whole idea of a driverless car just moderately terrifying? Hands up if you do find this whole idea pretty nerve-wracking. Lots of us do. I and mean, the interesting thing is this technology is actually a whole lot closer than most of us realise. In fact, just before COVID hit, I had the chance to spend a chunk of time in Silicon Valley watching some of this technology being trialled. The stuff I got to watch in action was the driverless car tech being developed by Waymo, which is Google's driverless car spin-off company. And I've got to tell you, even in late 2019, I was stunned at how clever this technology is, how intuitive it is. But even if you talk to the peeps at Google in late 2019, they're like, this won't be on public roads for at least another seven to ten years. Why? Because lawmakers are like nervous. We're talking sphincter tightening nervousness, right? About, you know, like a driverless car being on the roads with human drivers as well. And what's interesting is that changed in the middle of the pandemic, and most of us have no idea. In fact, one of the most significant news stories of the last two and a half years was this one in late 2020 when we saw regulators, in, and it was something that shocked the industry, they actually decided to accelerate their approval of driverless cars and actually give the green light for the world's first fully autonomous ride-sharing service to begin operating in Phoenix, Arizona. Like, as we sit here this afternoon, there are people in Phoenix, going from point A to point B, with no human driver involved at all. Now, if that seems a bit, like, inconceivable, I'm going to show you a video in a few moments of what's happening right now in Phoenix, Arizona. As you watch this little video, I want you to pop yourself in the car. Imagine what it feels like, like, viscerally would feel like, to be in the back seat of a car where no one's driving the thing. Like, imagine what that feels like, okay? Let's have a quick look up here on the screen. Check it out. It's crazy stuff, isn't it? And I love that comment there from the reporter. This requires just a little bit of trust. Like, do you think? I mean, how many of you, who'd be up for it? Who'd get into one of these cars if I pulled up right now? Awesome, about 20% of you, and the rest of you are like, I'm not so sure, okay? And what's interesting is we've seen in the last couple of months some even more staggering announcements in this whole area of technology. In fact, we saw a few months ago Baidu, which is like the, the Google of China in many ways, they've announced they're going to release a car next year to go into a robo-taxi fleet that'll have a detachable steering wheel. So legally, you can't sell it without a steering wheel. As soon as it goes into service, they're going to take the steering wheel out. It won't be needed. And then Tesla said, well, you think that's clever? By 2024, they're going to release a vehicle model that has no foot pedals either, just for good measure. Like, so it gives you a sense of how rapidly this stuff is moving. In fact, interestingly, there was some research done recently asking people, like, if we're not far away from not having to concentrate on driving our cars, what are you going to spend your time in a driverless car doing? Okay, when they asked consumers this question, five things came at the top of the list. And I want to give you just... 20 seconds of the person next to you. If you had to guess one of those top five things people said when asked this question, what do you reckon one of those top five things was? So just 15 to 20 seconds, person next to you, go for it. All right, 10 seconds to go. 
All right, five seconds. Five, four, three, two, and one. All right, okay, anyone brave enough to share? What did you reckon came up in the top five list? Any guesses what was on that top five list? Who's willing to shout out? It's so hard to see your hands. So you can just shout them out. What was the first one? Having a sleep, which by the way, which was one of the top five, but can you imagine just how much trust that takes in a car to actually drift off to sleep while this thing's hurtling down the freeway? So sleep was one. What was the other one that someone shouted out there? I missed it. Okay, who else is willing to shout out? What do you reckon was on the top five? Social media and legally checking Instagram rather than how it happens now, which is people driving down the freeway doing that anyway, even though they're not allowed. Thank you. That was on the top five list. Any other things you reckon are on this list? Reading the paper, like, how ironic, hey? Reading an old school newspaper in your driverless car, okay? And that was not one of the top five, but related to one of the top five, okay? I'll tell you what the top five were. You might be surprised to hear some of these. You guessed a few of them. So number one, um, the first thing people said was being entertained, so watching TV and movies. Social media was a part of that too. Number two was doing work, so catching up on email. Number three was having a sleep. Number four was eating and drinking. And number five surprised me. What surprises me even more, though, is how often people say this one. Like, I was working with some primary school principals recently, and one of the dirty buggers, the first thing he said when I asked them what was on the list, this is the first thing he came up with, okay? And the word the researchers came back with was the word romance, um, which <laughs> would make the morning commute a whole lot more interesting and awkward if you pull up next to that while it's going down in the car next to you right at the lights. But, I mean, it gives you a sense of how rapidly this technology is moving and how it changes daily life for so much of us. Now, of course... In terms of the industry here, what are some of the things we're already seeing come into play? What we're seeing happen in the whole area of robotics is really hard to go past in terms of how significant this is. And it's some of the very same technology happening in driverless cars being deployed in all sorts of robots right now being used right throughout the supply chain. I was actually speaking last week at the meat processing conference in Melbourne and I was stunned at just how many robotic devices they were showing. I actually got to try on an exoskeleton at the conference because they're using those in many of the meat processing facilities. And it was just amazing how quickly this technology is being used, particularly from a processing perspective. But I mean, robots have had a really busy time throughout COVID. In fact, one robot in particular, I don't know if you've seen this robot before, a robot called Spot. So Spot is like the robot dog developed by Boston Dynamics, which used to be, you know, it came out of MIT in, in Boston, but now it's been bought by Hyundai, so it's being rolled out as a mainstream product. The reason it's had a busy time throughout COVID is a couple of governments around the world bought a whole fleet of Spots to enforce things like mask wearing and social distancing. In fact, in Singapore, they sort of sent a whole lot of Spots out into the community to basically bark at people if they were like congregating too closely. And I thought, imagine if you did that in Australia, like it'd be chucked in the river pronto if you tried to do that here. But in Singapore, they were very, very compliant. But I've seen, I'm starting to see Spot being used in a whole lot of different areas. In fact, I was working with SA Power Networks a bit over a year ago, and they were telling me they've just purchased a couple of Spots to roam around the network in South Australia and monitor the poles and wires to identify issues around maintenance. So it's logging data and taking photos, and it's doing it often in really remote, rugged, dangerous areas where it's actually really tricky to get humans to go. And yeah, the whole discussion about this, particularly at, at SA Power Networks, is a lot of the maintenance engineers like, are you just trying to put us out of a job? And yet the challenge is, and we're seeing this in so many industries right now, this is not to like put humans out of work, it's because we just can't find the humans to do the work. And you look at how much of agriculture right now is investing heavily in this. In primary production, robots and robotic devices just because we can't get the humans to do the stuff. And of course, we're seeing in this space the same sort of material being used, same sort of technology. You would have seen the bunk bot next door, which is just one of the examples we're seeing from a feedlot standpoint of the same sort of technology being used. Um, even if you look at biometrics, I mean, the, the area of biometrics is fascinating. I saw a couple of people wandering around with the UNE um, logo on their shirts, and I'm not sure what part of UNE you guys are from, but I've been following some of the work that the crew at UNE have been doing around facial recognition for livestock, and it's incredible stuff. So this has only been rolled out in the last 12 to 13 months, and the early signs are extraordinary. It's like 98 to 99% accuracy in identifying and monitoring herds or livestock using muzzle recognition, the same that you would use with facial recognition in humans. So the use of AI, and there's so much more we could talk about, is, stuff, it def is definitely a, a tidal trend to watch. Now, if we look at the people side of things, the second tidal trend I wanted to look at deals with the future of the industry from a people standpoint, particularly what I often refer to as the post millennial era because we've talked about like millennials or gen y for a lot of years now but i've got to tell you our focus needs to shift really fast 
We need to start talking about the next generation coming through, this group called Generation Z. And um, Generation Z, of course, I don't know if you're aware of this, they're getting all grown up. So the oldest Gen Zs are like 23 or 22 years of age now. So I should just check, are there any Gen Zs in the room here this afternoon? Okay, any Gen Zs? Okay, there's a few of you. We'll talk about, we talk about you as if you're not here, okay? So just to give you a bit of a sense of who Gen Z are. So these are the birth years, born the late 90s through to the early 2010s. Now, how many of you have got a whole stack of Gen Zs at home in your families? Hands up if that's you, okay? Quite a few more hands there. And when this is a generation from a labour market perspective, they will be 36% of Australia's labour market within six years. And so we've got to get our heads around how to engage this next generation coming through. And we could, again, spend a half an hour or so just drilling down, looking at some of the defining attitudes, the attributes of this cohort. How do you engage them as staff or as customers? But it's interesting, one of the most defining at at attributes, and this is where it becomes tricky for a whole lot of industries right now, including in this space here, is the whole discussion around sustainability. And so for them, 73% of Gen Zs, they're prepared to pay more for stuff that is sourced sustainably. So the whole paddock to plate discussion, this actually can be a huge competitive advantage with Generation Z, because it really truly does shape their purchasing habits. And it's not just Gen Z, it's broader than this. In fact, I don't know if you saw this news story about 13 months ago, a Belgian supermarket um, decided to start printing on customers' receipts Essentially, the carbon price for everything they were purchasing, there was line items on their receipts. As soon as they did this, people began buying less red meat. And the challenge is the data they're seeing on that receipt often isn't put in context. And so this is where the industry's got to get a whole lot more clever at putting that data in context, because otherwise people often make decisions that are superficial and are not informed. And you know that, and this is one of the big challenges, particularly with Gen Z. If we look at their whole focus on sustainability, though, a good example of how significant this is for Gen Z, um, a, co a company that I'm guessing many of you have heard of called Etsy, this time last year spent $1.6 billion to buy an app that I'm guessing some of you have never heard of called Depop. Who's never heard of Depop before this moment in your life? Hand up if you haven't. Okay, ask your Gen Z, they'll tell you what it is. So Depop is like a, a fashion um, reselling sort of app. Basically, you can buy and sell used fashion and accessories, and it goes to this very desire for Gen Z to be more sustainable in the stuff they wear, the stuff they use, the stuff they buy. But what's interesting is if you're Etsy, you do not shell out $1.6 billion to buy this thing unless you know that's where the world is heading. And so you look at an app like Depop, that's definitely one that's hot with Generation Z. Another app is um, Be Real. If you haven't seen Be Real, that's one to get your head around because that's what Gen Z are using a lot right now. One that I was reading this morning is called Gas. So apparently in the last month, this, this is um, an, app, an app called Gas. And it's actually quite a lovely one. So what it does is actually an app where you can anonymously say something nice about someone and it gets sent to them. And this, is, this was the number one downloaded app for Gen Z last month in the US. So it sort of points to the fact that you've got a generation who I think are actually getting a bit fed up of how vain and vacuous and, and nasty Facebook and Instagram are, and we're seeing a shift away from that, which is actually really encouraging. But if you look at the discussion of like, what are the apps that Gen Z are spending a lot of time on, here are the top six that you need to get your head around. If you don't know these six apps, you need to get to know them pretty quickly because these are, for those of you with Gen Zs at home, this is where your kids are spending time right now. This is where your future customer, your future colleagues, your future staff. Now, I'm guessing some of you, or most of you will know number one. Like, we know TikTok. I wonder how many of you, who knows more than three or four of these? Anyone know more than three or four? Okay. No hands in the room. All right, I'll put you out of your misery. These are the six, okay, that you need to get to know. These are the six apps that Gen Z are spending a lot of time on right now. And if you just look at TikTok alone and how significant that one is, we saw a couple of months ago a staggering announcement that for Gen Z, on average, they use TikTok for 82 minutes every single day. That is more time than they spend on YouTube, more time they spend on Facebook and Instagram combined. This is massive. Now, those of you with teenage kids, that's probably not a massive surprise to you because you see this at home in your families. And this is significant in terms of how we reach or engage this group as staff or as customers. In fact, the case in point around how significant this is, is this brand here. So Martinelli's is a brand that probably a lot of you don't know. It's a very iconic American apple juice brand. They went viral on TikTok with Gen Z a little while back. And the reason they went viral with Gen Z on TikTok is because a whole lot of Gen Zs discovered if you bite into the packaging of Martinelli's, it sounds like you're biting into an apple, to which you might think, and that matters because, which is a very reasonable question, okay? But I want to show you what went viral on TikTok with Gen Z and then show you the impact this had on this brand. Let's have a quick look up here on the screen. Check it out. 
Okay, guys, so we have these apple juice that when you bite the plastic, it's supposed to sound like you're eating an apple, so I'm gonna try it. Did that kind of sound like it? Now, I don't know how many of you look at that video and think, and that is everything that is wrong with the younger generation, like right there in one clip, okay? And I get it, okay? And yet, look at the impact this had on Martinelli's as a brand in terms of how relevant they were or how cool they were in the eyes of Gen Z. Massive spike in online engagement. And this means the, the game is changing in terms of how we reach out to and connect with this emerging generation coming through. Now, before we move off the whole topic of generational change, I want to give you a bit of an insight into some of the language that Gen Z use. Now, if you're a parent of a Gen Z, this could be invaluable insight, okay? Because I'm going to tell you some of the emojis that Gen Zs are using in your families when they text you, that you, it's, not, it's by design that you don't understand them. I'm going to tell you what they mean, okay? And this is, again, pretty useful to know. So up on the screen here are six of the most common emojis that Gen Z are using right now. And if you're an old person like me, a non-Gen Z, oh, like I use the one second from the top if someone's got like, you know, a cough or a cold or COVID or allergies or whatever. But one second from the bottom, that used to be one of my default smiling emojis until I discovered what this means if you're a Gen Z. And it was really different to what I thought it meant, which was a bit of a shock, okay? So if you are a parent, you may want to grab out your phone in a few moments, because I'm going to put up on the screen behind me here what these emojis mean. And this, again, is really useful to know if you are a parent. Now, this might surprise some of you, but here is what these emojis mean if you're a Gen Z. Now, I don't know why that one second from the bottom means extreme passive aggression, but you better know that, okay? Otherwise, you could use that and mean one thing, and what they'll perceive and what you said is something entirely different. Now, we could spend you know, a whole stack more time sort of again drilling into this whole discussion about what are the trends that will shape the next few years, but while it's important we do that, that we identify what the stuff that's coming, it is just as important that we take steps to make sure we're ready. Now, how do we gear up for the things that'll shape the coming few years for all of us? And if we're gonna do that, my encouragement is simply this. You and I need to be really careful to avoid what I often refer to as the autopilot trap of just doing stuff in our organizations, in our teams, in our roles, a certain way, just because that's the way we've always done it. And we so easily fall into this trap. The problem, of course, is this becomes the number one enemy of innovation, the thing that stops you staying at the cutting edge as times and needs evolve. Now, I'm guessing many of you be very well familiar with this quote from Einstein up on the screen behind me. Einstein was famous for saying that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. We know that. It's almost a cliche, that quote, these days. But I, can I put it to you? If Einstein was defining insanity today, in October 2022, based on just how much we've seen change in the last few years and how much change lies ahead, I have a hunch he'd define insanity today the opposite way to what we see on the screen there behind me. I reckon he'd say that today, actually, it's insane for you to be doing the same thing over and over again, expecting to get the same result. Now, follow me here. What I mean by this is, if you're using the same techniques, the same approaches, the same systems that you were using 12 months ago, two years ago, three years ago, expecting them to get the same results they got in the past, you're going to be sorely mistaken. I mean, the pace of change means no matter how best practice the way you do stuff is, you can never stand still for long. And what I've loved looking at in recent times is brands and organizations that have taken steps to avoid that autopilot trap of just doing things the same way over and over again. And one of my favorite examples of a business that's done this beautifully over the recent years is this company here. Now, I'm guessing many of you will be familiar with Oricon. They're a global design and engineering firm, big presence here in Australia. A few years ago, they got, they got to a point where they realized they're actually falling behind. You know, they were pitching for work, work that had been tendered, and they were losing out on the jobs. And the feedback from customers or clients or potential clients was, you know, we like you guys, but you're just, you're just not creative enough. You're not innovative enough. You're too stuck in your ways. And so the executive team at Oricon realized they had to very quickly figure out a way to shift the culture of the company. And the way they did this, and you, some of you will love this idea, you may even want to try this in your own context. They developed an initiative called the Dumb Things We Do Initiative. And what they did is they said to all their staff globally, okay, we'd love to hear from you. What are the things that we do as a company that you reckon are just a little bit dumb? 
that don't make sense, that aren't getting results, that are sort of stuck in the past. And now I don't think the leadership team were quite ready for how many things would be suggested. It's like the floodgates opened. You know, within a couple of days, they had hundreds of ideas that had come in from team members all over the globe. And it was a bit confronting, by the way, because some of the things that were suggested, those leaders had put into place eight years ago or 10 years ago. And they had to have the humility to realize that maybe it was best practice then, but it's not now. That's confronting for anyone, really. So, yeah, the leadership team gathered all these lists of hundreds of suggestions of dumb things the company does, and they condensed it down to a top 100 list, and here's what they did next. They went to the company and said, look, thank you for engaging in this process. Here is our commitment to you. In 100 days, we'll fix or get rid of every single one of these 100 things. That's a massive task, but they did it. Huge undertaking. And I was interviewing one of the guys who was on the exec team at Oricon at the time, a little while back, a guy named John McGuire. And I said, you know, what was the experience like? And he said, this whole dumb things we do campaign, he said, it radically changed the company. We talked about innovation for years, but until there was a specific mechanism for doing it, no one was actually thinking outside the box. In fact, within two years of them doing this initiative, Oricon went from being sort of stuck in the past to winning, and this is extraordinary, winning the, the AFR's most innovative company in Australia across every category, which has never happened for an engineering firm before. And so much of that was because of this one campaign. And so there's value in sort of crowdsourcing innovation and ideas to stay at the cutting edge as times change, as Oricon did. I'd also put it to you, the most powerful asset any team or any organization has got for innovation, for staying at the cutting edge, not you know, falling into that autopilot trap, is the person in that team who's got the freshest eyes. Like it might be someone who's like brand new, brand new to the industry, brand new to the team, because here's the beauty of people with fresh eyes. They don't know how it's always been done. They'll have no trouble thinking outside the box. They don't even know what the box looks like at this point. No one's showed them. In fact, I love this student's exam response as a, a case in point of you know, thinking outside the box and seeing things that all the experts had missed. Now, maths teachers at school will tell you this is not called fresh eyes, it's called smart ass, okay? But it does like, sort of make the point to seeing things that everyone else had missed. And that's what people with fresh eyes will so often do. Now, it's interesting, I was doing some work with a group of local government leaders. In fact, it was in this venue, this very venue a little while back. And I was chatting with one of the guys at the back there with that like a morning tea thing set up at this corner of the room. And I was chatting with one of the guys who was actually the head of asset management for one of the big councils here in Queensland who will, will remain nameless. And he said that had this very experience in the last year of someone with fresh eyes coming on to staff at council and ushering through really significant innovation because of their fresh eyes. And he was telling me the story, so they had this young guy come straight out of university, start working at council in the asset management department. And this guy with fresh eyes noticed something that he thought was a bit strange. What he noticed is the council had all these things they were using, like all these things in their asset registry, they were paying monthly rental costs on. It's like, why do we rent things we know we're gonna need for like a really, really long period of time? Why don't we just buy them outright? In fact, he ran some numbers on a few things in their asset registry. For instance, there was a, a couple of box trailers, a number of box trailers, where the average trailer they'd been renting for 12 or 13 years, paying monthly rental costs, they'd spent on average $23,000 renting these trailers, they cost six grand to buy. And so he goes to his boss, the dude I'm chatting to at the back of the room here at this conference, and he's like, so why do we do that? Like, why, why don't we buy them and depreciate them? And so he dug a little bit further and found they had this whole fleet of pedestal fans that council was using. The average fan they'd spent $5,000 renting, they cost 160 bucks to buy from Bunnings. He's like, what's the deal? As this guy I was chatting to said it was a bit confronting at first, this young punk coming into the team and challenging the way we did things, but he said, I had to sort of take it on board because he said it was actually a really good question and I didn't really have a good answer. I just, when I turned up at council to take over the department, that's just the way it was done. So we would sort of, we'd improve the system, but it basically kept the system as it was. And now if you know anything about how local government works, what happened next was like a steering reference group was formed and then two or three committees to evaluate it. And like I think seven months later, he said they finally got to the point where they bit the bullet and did something very daring. They moved from like a rent model to a buy and depreciate model. And he lent in, he said, you've got no idea how much money this is saving taxpayers or ratepayers in our council area. It's huge. He said, I'm almost embarrassed by it. He said, I can't believe it. We hadn't seen it before, but it took someone with fresh eyes coming in to see that for what it was. And that's the gift that people with fresh eyes will be if we enable them to ask why to challenge. Truth is, let's be honest, what do we mostly do when people with fresh eyes come into a team? We basically say, sit in the corner, look and learn, watch how we do stuff. 
Once you know how we do things, then you can start offering some ideas. Hey, by that point, they haven't got fresh eyes anymore. And when I heard that story about the example at this council, it reminded me of this beautiful quote from the late Dr. Wayne Dyer, who said that when we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change. And that's the beauty of people with fresh eyes. They'll just see stuff differently. And that can be a gift, absolute gift, when it comes to innovation. All right, we are almost out of time. I'm going to wrap up in just a couple of moments. What I'll do before we finish up, I'll just pop my details up on the screen. Look, feel free to have a look at the website. A whole pile of stuff that could be useful up on the website. A whole video channel, for instance, with short clips that build on some of the stuff we've talked about today. Um, that QR code is for my LinkedIn profile. So if you spend any time on LinkedIn, and a number of you I'm already connected with on LinkedIn, um, but if we're not connected already, feel free to scan that and connect on LinkedIn. Every day at about 8.45, I'll do a daily update. And that daily update is whatever I've seen come through overnight. So new technology, new data, any new trends that have sort of come to light, just so people can stay on top of this stuff because it's like a torrent of information you've got to sort of stay across if you want to you know, keep up with what's happening in the world of technology particularly. So if that's helpful, just feel free to reach out and keep an eye out every morning. You'll just see that update come through on, on LinkedIn. The other thing in case it'd be helpful before you um, wrap things up, we had a book come out a couple of months ago now, and it's an e-book, so it's not in like bookstores, but it's an e-book we released looking at like the 10 sort of title trends that COVID has sped up. And we looked at two of them this afternoon in the book. I would say that if you look at the space you guys are all playing, there's probably six or seven of these that are super relevant in the next like, five to 10 years. Um, so if you want to get a copy of that book, what we've arranged with the publishers is actually would allow people at events like this to get it at half the price that Kindle charge. So if you want to get a copy of that um, at the half price, what Kindle charge, I'll put another QR code in a couple of moments. If you scan that QR code, it'll take you to a page where you can like download um, the book at the half price caper. So I would just say, get a copy, share it around. Like, start this conversation about what's the stuff that's coming that we, just, we can't afford to get blindsided by because um, that's you know, it's, it's, it's the reality for all of us. Um, just as we wrap things up, though, I wanted to leave you this afternoon with a quote. What I love about this particular quote, um, firstly, is its age. It's 2,600 years old. But I reckon this quote is actually more relevant today than ever before. And it's a quote from the great Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu, who put it beautifully when he said this, resisting change is a little bit like trying to hold your breath. Even if, even if you are successful, it's not going to end well, okay? And that would be my simple encouragement to you is that I get it. Like, you know, I think to, to Jerry's point at the beginning, for a lot of us, there is like we're a bit overwhelmed with change. We just would love things to settle down a bit, go back to the way they were. And I get that natural instinct after such a tumultuous few years. But the reality is these changes aren't going to go away. We can't ignore them. We can't fight them. All we can do is adapt in the face of them. So again, thank you so much for the invitation. I hope that was useful. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Cheers.